it should go without saying that Christians are a Christ-centered people. It should go without saying because it's in the name, isn't it? You are a Christian. And the word means a follower of Christ. Although today it can mean a number of things. It can mean good people. It can mean people who believe in Christ. It can mean people who generally accept a worldview that is generally held by people who profess to follow Christ. And so you have a lot of people who would take that name upon themselves, who would call themselves Christian for a number of reasons. But the name originally meant a follower of Christ. And so a Christian should be someone whose life is centered around Christ. What does that mean, though, to have my life centered around Christ? What does it mean that I am a person whose whole life is about Him? Well, if we can figure that out, then we can figure out what it means to be Christ's church. Christians are together in the church that God has built. That is what is taught in the New Testament. As you become a Christian, you are added to a group of Christ followers. You are necessarily a part of that body of Christians. In Acts chapter 2, we can demonstrate this, that those who were being saved were also being added to them, added to their number. The word church in the Greek doesn't appear there. It's added to them. But it's not real hard to figure out who the them is. The Lord was adding to them all those people who were praising God and having favor with all the people, those who were being saved. Those who were being saved were being added to the number of believers who already were there, those, pre those people who were preaching and teaching the Word of God. And so as we are saved, we are numbered with those people. We become a part of a community of God's people, a people who are centered around Christ, who follow after Him, whose lives are defined by Him. And so we are numbered with those people. The word church in the New Testament refers to those people who have been called out from among the world and called into God's people. We have been called out, separated drawn out from among the world and added to the number of believers. The rest of those people who have been called out. And I want you to notice in the book of Ephesians how Paul thinks about the church. Those people who have been called out of the world and who have been called to be among people who are believers in Christ. He thinks of them as being situated in, in a number of different places, but primarily they are situated below Christ. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, we find where Paul has this prayer for the Ephesians. He wants certain things for them. He wants them to attain to knowledge. He wants them to attain to uh, to this obedience, to, the, uh, uh, to what God has called them to. But he points ultimately to Christ when he talks about this knowledge. He wants them to know what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe. There's the church. Toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Let's pause there for a minute and let's note that Paul situates Christ at the head of all things. He raised Him from the dead and seated Christ at His right hand in the heavenly places. 
Christ now occupies that place that he deserves. A place at the right hand of God. And if you study the New Testament and, and you think about uh, that position, to be at the right hand of the throne of God, what it is is a claim that Christ is divine. He sits there at the right hand of God because he is God. He is equal with God. He deserves to be in God's presence praised with God. And so Christ is situated at the head of all things, over all things. We read on. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Christ is so situated above all things that he is above, let me repeat and emphasize, all things. Everything. Not just everything that is on the earth, but everything that is above and beyond the earth. All principalities and powers and might and dominion, all authorities, all things that could claim authority. We might have here also a reference to, uh, to various angelic hosts. And so he is above not just all physical things, but above all spiritual things as well. And above every name that is named. Again, we have a, an, an idea there that is deeply rooted in, uh, in, the New Testament's, in the New Testament's theology of the deity of Christ. Not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And so he is above everything, not just physical, but spiritual. Not just, uh, uh, not just that he happens to be above everything, but that he deserves to be above everything. He is himself divine. He is God. And He is above not just all of those things, but He is above all of time and space and era. He is the highest possible thing there is to be. He is above all. And Paul continues, and He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so he is not just above physical and spiritual, not just that he deserves to be there being God, not just that he is above all of time and space, not just that he is above literally everything that is made. He is above all things specifically pertaining to his body. You see Christ positioned at the head, and his people, the church, situated beneath him. And so Christ is the head, not just of all things in general, although that's true, he is the head specifically of the church. The head of his people, above them, in power and authority over them. He is God over them. And always will be. That is where God has put him. And if we are to be the church of God's intent, if we are to be Christians among those people who are believers in Christ, we have to recognize that we are subservient to Christ. We are situated beneath him. Subordinate to him in service to Him. I stress that so much because the world has forgotten that. When I say the world, I mean the world of Christianity writ large. We, have, we seem to have forgotten that God intended for Christians to serve Christ. Not ourselves. How much of the world of Christianity is now wrapped up in figuring out what we want, what we expect, what would 
satisfy us? What would attract us? What would please us? What we think ought to be. How we think we need to live. What we think we need to do. How much of the world of Christianity broadly is now focused upon me. Oh, how we have forgotten that He is the head of all things. And especially all things as they pertain to the church. How we have forgotten that we are His body. How we have forgotten that it is He who fills everything. He who permeates everything. He who fills up to its fullness everything that there is. And by the way, that's not me. I don't do that. I don't fill up everything. I am not the most important thing here. I am not the one who completes this. I am not the center of this. My life is not the center of my life. And neither is yours. How often in the past few weeks have we quoted from Galatians 2.20 and made this exact point. I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And yet too often, we want to focus on the fact that I live by my faith. My faith is what's important. My faith is the one that fills up. My faith is the one that completes. I'm centered around my faith. No, I'm centered around my faith in the Son of God. My faith is useless if it is not rooted in Him. It is He who fills up all in all. And the church being subservient to Him means that we have certain obligations to Him. Everything that we do as Christians points to Him. Everything. And so everything that we do must glorify Him, must exalt Him, praise Him, uplift Him, point others to Him. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1 a little bit before verses 22 and 23. Back to verse 3, where Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And sometimes we'll look at that and we'll say, Oh, well, how blessed we are. You know, that's actually a really good point from that verse, isn't it? It's not the main point. Yes, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Yes, He has done that. But why did Paul say that? We want to forget that that's just a... a, a, Grammatically speaking, it's a dependent clause, okay? It depends on another main part of the sentence, which is, blessed be God. When we think about the blessings that we have, why are we doing so? It had better be so that we may direct our thanks and our praise to the God who gave us those things. Oh, let's not forget that everything that we have comes from God, sure, but that we had better thank Him for giving us those things. And beyond thanking Him, we had better praise Him for giving us those things. Read on. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself. Now sometimes we'll pause there uh, and we'll say, how wonderful it is that God has saved us. Because frankly, isn't it wonderful that God has saved us? And we'll talk about our salvation and how we attained that salvation and what it means for us. And all of that is wonderful and all of that is great. It's all true. But why? Why are we talking about the God that saved us? Read on. 
as He predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Giving honor and praise and glory to Him. You see, my salvation is not about me. God saved me, but not... I benefit from it. But that salvation is not about me. Why do I come to God? Am I coming to God because there is something in it for me? I mean, there is something in it. I I, I want to try to walk a fine line here. I, I don't want to suggest that we cannot be joyful in the salvation that God has given us. Certainly we can and God wants us to. But for what purpose? Why? And to whom are we expressing our joy? Am I saved simply because I want to be saved? Did I come to God only for the purpose of getting out of something that I did to myself? There might be something in this when Jesus said, whoever would, would save his life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. There might be something in that. It may be that we cannot come to God with some kind of ulterior motive to where I get something out of this salvation, but God gets nothing. It does not work that way. No, instead, we are to the praise of His glory. And so over in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul would talk about how, how he bows his knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, verse 14, and so on. He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Yes, I want you to be all of those things. I want you to be advantaged in that way. I want you to be built up into Christ. But why? Verses 20 and 21, we often forget. To Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. We exist so that God may be glorified. We exist so that Christ may be praised. And everything we do had better be to that end. Everything. Whether that is individually, in my life, in your life, or whether that is corporately, we together are doing something. We had better be to the praise and honor and glory of God. Beyond that, everything that we do had better be because we're obeying God. Him. Because if He is the head and we are the body, if we are subservient to Him, if we are subordinate to Him, you can even hear the concept in those words. Subservient. We serve under Him. Subordinate. We ordinate ourselves beneath Him. That is the order of things. And so what, whatever He wills, that is what we do. We serve at His pleasure to do His will, whatever He wants. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and you can see this. Beginning in verse 22, Paul starts to talk about husbands and wives submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's verse 21. If you want to understand Ephesians 5.22 through down about verse 6.9 or so, uh, then study what Ephesians 5.21 means. 
submitting to one another in the fear of God. What does that look like? Well, for husbands and wives, it looks like this. For children and parents, it looks like this. For servants and masters, it looks like this. And if we can understand Ephesians 5.21, then we can understand better what Paul is talking about in in Ephesians 6, 5 through 6, 9. But let's not mistake this. Let's not forget something here. That especially in Ephesians 5, 22 through uh, through 33, Paul has a specific relationship in mind. In verse 32, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We get the analogy all wrong. The analogy, the, the specific application of it is to help husbands and wives understand how they ought to submit to one another. And how does he help us to understand how husbands and wives should submit to one another? He shows us what Christ and the church do. Now we'll focus sometimes, and we have even from this pulpit as we ought, on verses 25 and 26 and 27, and talk about the love that Christ has for the church. That's wonderful, and I'm glad we do that. But we need to remember that verses 22 and 23 and 24 are also about Christ and the church. Verses 22 and 23 and 24, they are also about that relationship. And it's not only about the love that Christ has for the church. It's not only about the fact that Christ gave himself for us. It's not only about the fact that Christ will cleanse us and wash us and make us holy so that he might present us to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It's not only about that. It's not only about what Christ has done for us. We have an obligation to Him. We'll forget that if we're not careful. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Oh yes, He's the Savior of the body. He saved us, died for us, loved us that much so that He could present Himself, so that He could present us to Himself as glorious and exalted. But because He did that, we obey Him. He demonstrated through His life and His death, and His grace, and His kindness toward us in forgiving us, that He lives for our benefit. He gave Himself wholly to us. And so our response, our natural response, is to obey Him in everything. We are subservient to Him. And that means what He says goes. If He tells us to go, we go. If He tells us to stay, we stay. If He tells us to speak, we speak. If He tells us to be silent, we we are silent. If He tells us not to do something, we do not do it. If He tells us to do something, we do it. This is what it means to be Christ-centered. Whatever He says goes. And this is the theme of chapter 4 in Ephesians. This is how Ephesians 4 tells us to behave. Verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. You know what? They are serving themselves. Do not walk serving yourself anymore. You're not the Lord of your life. You're not the one who makes the calls. You're not in the driver's seat. You're not the one who determines where you go, what you do. You do not obey yourself. You do not follow your own lusts. 
your own desires, your own wants. Because you have not so learned Christ. That's not how you came to Him. If indeed you have heard Him and been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You change. You're not yours anymore. You're His. Walk that way, live that way. And so he spends the rest of the chapter, beginning in verse 25, telling us, be sure not to do this, don't do that, don't do this, but instead do these things. Instead of lying, you speak truth with your neighbor. Don't be, uh, uh, as you're angry, do not sin. Don't give a place to the devil. Don't give him some leeway. Don't give him a, 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 a way into your life. Instead of stealing, Work so that you may give. Notice the opposite there. I steal so that I may take. Instead, I work so that I may give. I don't work for work's sake. I don't work so that I may take. I don't work so that I may hoard it to myself. Instead, I work so that I may have in order to give to others. And that's something we get backwards too. We like to work so that we may take. I don't work so that I may take. I work so that I may have to give. Instead of letting corrupt speech out of my mouth, I let edifying speech come out of my mouth. Instead of grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom I was sealed by the day of redemption, I follow after Him. I live according to Him. I put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking away from me. And instead, I take up kindness and forgiveness and tenderheartedness just as God was kind and tenderhearted and forgiving toward me. What he says goes in everything, not just individually, but corporately as well. I live according to his will, doing what he says. That is what the church ought to be. And so if the Lord has commanded us not to do something, we had better not do it. Not because we feel like by not doing it we're, sudden, we're somehow better than others, but simply because He told us not to. And if the Lord has told us to do something, then we do it. Not because we feel like that makes us better than everybody else, but simply because the Lord told us to. And we're subservient to Him. The church of God's intent is placed beneath Him. He is head over all things to the church, which is His body. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. Because when the church is subservient to Him, He fills up everything. He is glorified, exalted, and we obey Him, follow Him, serve Him, because He is worthy to be served. Would you be added to that group of people? Would you be saved? Would you come to Him? Would you glorify Him? Serve Him? Because if you would, He has promised to save you. I'm reminded of another passage that would go along with this lesson well in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where Paul, quoting from the Old Testament, tells us that if we would come to Him, then, then I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. What a thought. Would you be His? And would you, uh, uh, would you have Him to be yours? If you would, then you have an opportunity this morning. Let's stand and sing.